Hi. Hi. Um, good morning or good evening, depends where you are. Uh, I will share my screen. Yep. So, uh, welcome everybody. Um, what I would like to talk today is container-based service mesh on, on FreeBSD. So roughly who I am, my name is uh, Luca. Uh, I'm part committer, um, currently working in Trivago as a SRE team lead. And because of that, I grow some interest in cloud technologies, but also with FreeBSD. So uh, what is the, the current status for FreeBSD in the cloud? Um, what this talk is about is about containers of FreeBSD and service mesh. Uh, usually on, on Linux, uh, you have Docker and Kubernetes. And we know there is usual question is about, can we have Docker on, uh, on FreeBSD? And ultimately, can you have something like Kubernetes on FreeBSD? Um, no, I will not speak about Docker on FreeBSD, but something, uh, a kind of parallel path that uh, we implemented in the last two years and it is available, but uh, open for, for discussion. So uh, start with what exactly is a container. There is no real definition on that. Um, this is a definition that you find in Docker uh, website. And as you see, it's not as a unit of software that packages up code and its dependency um, so that the application runs from one computing environment to another. I would like to highlight basically that is a way to distribute uh, applications. So uh, a self-contained uh, um, environment where you can put everything there, a kind of a tarball uh, with everything on it. But the second important part is the fact that you can move it. It's not just uh, on your, uh, in the place where you build it. Another element that is important is that containers uh, are not uh, virtual machines. Uh, the containers virtualize the operating system instead of the hardware. And it's something very similar or what we know uh, uh, as a jail. Um, in fact, it's almost known that containers on, on Linux um, has the inheritance from, from jails. Um, so are jails a container? Uh, can we use FreeBSD to build a technology that is similar uh, to, uh, to that and can enable basically containers alike deployment processes? I worked for a couple of years on, on a framework um, to manage jails, uh, exactly to, to evaluate uh, the ability to create this model. Uh, and it's written in POSIX SH, nothing really fancy, just to prove that FreeBSD has everything that is needed um, and nothing else is needed. Those are the technologies that are used. So JS to provide all sorts of isolations that are needed of a system isolation, process isolation, um, network isolation and things like that. Plus RCTL and CPU set to provide uh, resource limitations. That is an additional thing that is needed to uh, avoid uh, a process to um, compromise other uh, processes performance. And then there are uh, some abstraction uh, provided by BNET, PF for, PF for uh, redirection and, and NAT if needed, those two things are optional. Uh, we speak lengthy about uh, images um, and then yeah, NullFS for uh, mounting volumes inside, inside the jail. What is really different um, in a container, this is a best practice. Usually in a container, you have only one process per container. This is kind of a golden rule where all orchestrators are, are based on. Um, and usually this process is also not forking in the background. That creates issues when you are using J. Um, if you have an exit start that doesn't fork in background, uh, J is going to see doesn't finish. So basically you are not able to finish uh, the starting process uh, to start in the jail. So uh, BSH, uh, ATCFC, the typical default command is not suitable. 
in this case, you want to just start one process. So you put in the, at the start the exact comma that you want to start. Uh, and this process usually cannot, uh, as I said, uh, go in background. The important thing is that because jail, the command line basically doesn't finish to start the J somehow, uh, everything that is in post start will never be executed. And with that, um, I discovered that the persist parameter, um, if you want to disable the persistence, this is applied after the start is finished. Uh, so if you have a process that doesn't finish the start, actually you, this is not applied. Uh, I have a workaround on it, um, but the point is that usually containers are ephemeral. So uh, you have not persistent uh, containers. When the process inside the container uh, uh, finished, the container is automatically removed. The persist parameter, if you disable it, does exactly like that, but usually you have some cleanup to do uh, around it. And there is no way of it to do it right now. Uh, because there is no way um, to detect that the jail is uh, is cleaned up, is, is removed. Uh, there is some work uh, by some uh, another project called Kubernetes. Um, they developed this module to um, notify in DevCTL the jail events. So there is some work, and actually that assured me that okay, I wasn't alone to to see that that was somehow uh, needed. Now let's explain what image is. Um, this is an important, it's a very big difference in what usually on FreeBSD we use, uh, we use JS. Um, uh, Docker, uh, a typical container, uh, let's say Docker container um, development process looks like is that the developer creates uh, the pipeline to build a Docker and then the operations is taking care of this container and put it in production. Um, with jails, usually we have a lot of nice, super nice frameworks that take care of creating the jail directly on the machine that, um, that will execute then the application. Uh, so here the, the, the paradigm is somehow split in, in two. And so you create an image, you put it somewhere, and then uh, that will be deployed by, um, to the worker node. I use ZFS to take snapshots uh, of this data set and this is just the most simple uh, way to do it. Um, so you create and export the image, you upload the image somewhere else, and then uh, you download and import the image where, where you need. Um, it's still, I did some mistake when I create this. So uh, for me, it's still a little bit problematic to improve, let's say the, the image create, uh, creation process. Um, we can talk about it later uh, if we have time about this. Um, I didn't follow any OCI standard. OCI is the uh, Open Container uh, Initiative, some a consortium. Um, I just decided to, to keep it simple. So um, what I do as an image is I do I take a snapshot, then I do ZFS uh, send in pipe to uh, XZ, and there is uh, its image. To um, uh, provide some automation. Uh, usually what you have in, in Docker, you have this Docker file where you have all those run um, uh, entry when you can just uh, execute command to create basically the container. Uh, and I did something similar just with shell script. So if you have a shell script that can be uh, reused, executed inside the container at creation time, uh, and that's provide the automation level to, um, to auto provision uh, a J. There are other thousand ways. Um, this was just just one um, that I implemented, and this is the example. Basically, uh, let's see, you create, um, uh, you specify the, the name of the of the container, uh, the base version of FreeBSD that you want to use, single to mention that you want to use one single data set, and then you can have multiple scripts. Basically, they will do uh, actions. So basically, you run FreeBSD updates. Uh, because uh, the base will use the base tick set, so um, the real base used in release. So it, no updates usually are inherited here. So you need to run FreeBSD update if you want the last updates. Uh, then here, uh, Nginx will install Nginx, and then Slim uh, will just delete things that are not used in, in runtime 
for this kind of images like uh, CLANG or header files or debug or test or things like that. Uh, it's just to make it smaller and to make the process faster. Um, then what snapshot will just take the snapshot of, um, of that ZFS data set and then with export, uh, it created the, the tarball that is basically the image. Um, two things to mention, one is the tag that is needed. So the images need some versioning. Um, and, and then the, the FreeBSD um, has with its release cycles um, impose some strict ruling about uh, what JS can run where. Um, and this is something that I didn't really kept in, in mind when I started to work on this. Um, so the version of FreeBSD is, is important when you create an image because it limits where this image can, can run uh, because the kernels obviously uh, in the host system can be different. Um, so the idea for me was to keep the registry. Um, so basically where you collect all your images, very simple. Um, so just a simple HTTP server with, with files that you can download. Um, that was a very bad idea uh, because then uh, I only had the file name to collect all the metadata. So uh, it was a very poor decision. That's why, for instance, you have uh, in, in Docker, you have those registries. They are not just file server, but they have uh, something more sophisticated. Um, not super sophisticated, but you cannot just rely on a file name. Uh, you have to put the, the, the version, the tag basically for the version. In this case, for FreeBSD, it would be nice to have also the, uh, the version of FreeBSD uh, and also the architecture that you can have and things like that, something similar that we have in PKG. Uh, so that was the first mistake. Um, also, with this pattern, we have uh, an image registry. It's also a way to, to, um, to distribute applications. Uh, there are security concerns because they didn't provide any form of signature and so on. Uh, those, was our, those were all uh, known issue. I didn't want to create a registry on, on purpose uh, because create a good registry is a project itself. However, um, Stefan uh, created um, a registry that is maintaining um, there is a public GitHub repo where you can put basically your recipes, your flavors, and he was taking care to, to build them automatically. So uh, there is some work in the community to, um, to have a registry, even if it's uh, more for used for fun and uh, it's not considered, uh, let's say, production grade. So uh, once we have a container. Um, the idea is to use an orchestrator to uh, to have this typical Kubernetes um, flow. And the idea is not to write a new orchestrator from scratch. This is a lot of work, uh, as you can imagine. So the idea was, okay, can we use something out there? Um, and Kubernetes is not a good candidate because it's rather monolithic and um, very tight to, to Linux. It has this pick basically with, uh, with IP tables and things like that. So uh, it's not really uh, friendly. However, um, in Chicago, we use Nomad. And I discovered actually Nomad is a pretty nice orchestrator. The first good thing is it's not monolithic. It's only the orchestrator. Other services are completely different tools. Um, it has a plugin architecture, relatively easy to implement, and basically it supports different type of containers or also not containers. So basically, you can run uh, uh, Java uh, jar file and, and things like that. So it is already designed to be, uh, let's say, more more open. Um, and also, the portability for uh, for is not optional. So basically, Ashicore provide binaries for many other. Uh, operating system like Solaris, FreeBSD, and so on. So it's already designed to be to be portable. Uh, while Kubernetes doesn't compile basically on uh, on FreeBSD, uh, Nomad is already um, is already available. So we said, okay, with a colleague of mine, um, Esteban, we tried to uh, write a, a driver. Actually, he wrote the driver, and we decided to follow uh, this idea to have everything that is OS independent more related to the interaction with Nomad 
uh, written in the driver, implemented in the driver, and everything that is instead dependent, uh, OS dependent, um, should be in the pod framework. So the, how the network is managed, the firewall, uh, and so on, should be there. Um, as you see, it's available in the in the port tree, so you can uh, download it. Um, the nice thing about using an orchestrator is that it solved two issues. The first thing is that um, uh, Nomad usually, uh, that Kubernetes, I mean, all the orchestrator are managing the log of your application. So basically, the applications that um, is executed as only the only process in your container write their log to standard up with a standard error, and then is the uh, orchestrator that will ship them and will manage them. Uh, and that is something you don't think about. There is no syslog in your container or things like that, so you don't have to think about those. The other thing is um, the fact that we know that uh, using jail that are not persistent, um, actually the, the orchestrator is taking care of assuring that the jail uh, is still up and running. If it's not there, uh, we implemented a cleanup, just running a pod stop to perform the cleanup uh, every time a, a, a jail disappear. And that solved the issues of this automatic cleanup that we cannot do basically uh, with uh, not persistent jails. I will go really fast on, on this. Um, the network support. Um, so basically, there are several ways in how you can run um, basically the pod framework and ultimately a, a nomad can execute a jail. Um, one is the typical inherit mode. So uh, the jail will use the same uh, network of the host. Uh, alias, the typical jail setup, where basically you provide a, a fixed IP and this IP will be attached to a network card. Uh, this makes a, a problem when you want to have multiple instances of the same job because Nomad is not uh, does not provide any uh, way to have you know multiple IPs for for for, for this case. Um, we're still working on that, but it's let's say it's not ideal. Doesn't really scale as a solution. Um, and then we have the public bridge that basically what it does. We have two different implementations for IPv4 and IPv6. For IPv4, how it works is that there is a, a bridge completely detached from, from the real network. Um, and then um, for every jail, a couple of, uh, a pair of e pair, uh, so basically with VNet, uh, is created. Uh, and all the jails will, will be attached to this bridge. And um, there is a PF rule for the outgoing traffic that is um, connected with the outside VNet. And then if you have a network services uh, that is listening on, on the jail, uh, it can be exposed via uh, a redirection rule in PF. Um, and that is how it works on IPv4. Or in IPv6, uh, instead, we try to uh, be smarter. And uh, it is a different bridge that will only host IPv6 traffic. Uh, and the, the network card is part of the bridge. And the ePair, in this case, is uh, automatically configured with Slack. And with everything here uh, available, uh, we can have something that it looks like, like Kubernetes. So basically, uh, this is more or less the, uh, the server mesh that you can have. Um, so you see the developer that submits a, a job in a form of a, this job description. They are the equivalent of uh, the manifest of, uh, of Kubernetes. Um, and then the Nomad server will take care of orchestrating, so basically allocating this job that with the risk, okay, which J should you use? Um, it will allocate to a worker node that is called Nomad Clients. Uh, it will download basically the image for the image registry. Uh, it will spin up and will um, start to work. And then Nomad Server in the, low, uh, you see in the bottom side will register basically these servers to console, that is the uh, service discovery uh, mechanism. So the real work is on the normal clients and in console, you have basically the meta data information, basically the information about this service, where it's running and how it's called. Additionally, there are uh, there is an L check that is running because console is also taking care of providing a list of the healthy nodes uh, that are implementing that specific service. And this is for the deployment side. 
Then to make this reachable, there is the service mesh. In this case, is implemented bit traffic that works as a load balancer. Um, traffic, what it does is in constant connection with console to know which services are available and where are running. So the healthy instances of the services. Uh, and then if a request um, come to traffic, you can implement basically the front end to um, understand what, um, what kind of services this uh, request is aiming. In this case, I just added a custom, um, a custom header, uh, XMesh service that can say, okay, I want to target that service specifically. Uh, traffic knows where it is and it sends uh, the traffic to the uh, specific client that is serving basically that, that service. Um, this exact uh, infrastructure is available in one port that is called Binipot. It's um, a single node implementation of everything that you see. Um, it's basically, it has all the dependencies. Uh, it will install all the dependencies. It will configure Nomad console and traffic to work together to provide an image like this. So if you want to give it a try, uh, Minipod will provide you um, a way to do it in a very easy way. Future works. So um, using the current container definition, um, there are a few things that will, uh, there are somehow requested. A better way to create images. Usually, images should be relatively small. I mean, a bigger image, it just um, takes just a long time to do everything. And in the runtime, there are a couple of things that are still missing. The most important one is the OM killer. Basically, RCTL is able to limit the amount of memory used by, by a jail, but if it the jail exceeds this amount, won't kill basically the content of the jail. Um, but this is what actually happened in C groups in, on Linux. So if a container uses more memory than uh, it's allocated to, it will be killed. And this is somehow something that you want to avoid uh, the loud neighborhoods effect. And then for specific use cases, uh, there are some people asking for um, UDP support. Uh, it's not yet there, I uh, have to work on it. Uh, but those are a few things that I'm uh, willing to work on. In, in this setup, this project is uh, something that I'm developing on my couch on Sunday. So that is why there is a couch. So it's a, a couch certified project. Um, even if it, there is a lot of things running on, it's still something that is manageable on, uh, on the couch. Um, however, if you want to go further, um, there is some more serious work to, to do. Um, so if you want a successful, let's say, container environment natively implemented in, in previously, uh, you need that image format that follows some, some kind of standard, uh, mainly because there is already um, good knowledge contained in this standard and you can have some interoperability with other uh, registry, for instance. You will need probably a runtime supervisor um, to overcome some limits that JS currently have. Uh, basically, JS exists as a, as a is a prison inside the kernel, but you don't have a lot of visibility of its um, life cycle outside it. And most importantly, uh, if there is no cross-platform support, uh, there it could be very difficult to be to be adopted. Um, what that means, uh, developers don't want to install basically FreeBSD to uh, to create an image. They want something that is friendly with their operating system of choice. Uh, what you see in Docker, Docker provides Docker machine to allow, um, for instance, uh, to run a, a Linux container on a Mac uh, and also to run Linux, uh, Linux container on, on a FreeBSD somehow. Um, there is this experimental project done also by, by Esteban, the, uh, the author of the driver. Um, what he did with Pot Machine is something similar. So basically uh, there is a small Go application that uh, will download uh, uh, with Vagrant uh, a FreeBSD instance with a red pot already configured and installed configured. And what it does, this command line utility, um, it has a couple of commands to interact with, um, to manage basically this virtual machine and everything, every other pot command is just forwarded internally. So you can control your, uh, your JS um, inside, uh, 
on, on a Mac or on a Linux machine. That was the basic idea. However, this is really a lot of work. Um, that is why it's not something that I can do alone, uh, that needs some community effort uh, to, to move forward. Um, last but not least, this is a, uh, um, not a provocation, but I know, kind of a proposal. Um, the future of computing, a lot of companies are moving to, to the cloud and the FreeBSD support to the cloud is limited. There are uh, some, some volunteers. I mean, say the work is not really organized or if really organic. Uh, maybe uh, it could be meaningful to, to have some cloud working group. Uh, I know, for instance, Li Wen uh, is working to provide images for, uh, for Azure. Uh, Colin is working uh, to, to provide images on AWS. Uh, I use GCP at work, and those images are not always great. Um, sometimes they're just panning or things like that, and that's complicated a bit. Uh, they work there. Uh, but suffice to say that the cloud is where a lot of companies are, are moving, and uh, FreeBSD there is not really present. So I just say uh, maybe an idea is to, to start a working group to see what we can do to, to be more present and to serve also uh, the cloud and not just uh, bare metal machines. And that is my last slide um, with all the links collected. Um, the only thing I want to mention in the documentation, the last link is um, a set of blog posts that Stefan did to, um, to create um, basically your virtual data center. So to implement uh, this setup uh, whenever you want. So it created a, an extensive blog post if you want to create it. Uh, on your own and, and test it. And that is everything I have to say. So let me check if there are some questions. Yep, you, there's some questions if you'd like to look at them. Yep. Uh, so let me read them. So are you going to work on providing slim images so that it's not necessary to ship the complete FreeBSD system to every application? Um, yeah, so the point is um, slim images, there are different approaches. Now I'm using base and remove what I don't need. Uh, ideally with package base, you can do the other way around. You just install PKG in time, then you install the package that you need and that is it. It would be better to actually use a uh, incremental approach instead of the other way around, install everything and remove what you don't you need. Um, the point is, it's hard to get, you know, a, a sling that, let's say, um, a script that detect every, to detect only what you need. Um, but there is some some work, let's say, in, in this direction. Um, another question: Do you think it's a good idea to implement OC specification for the FreeBSD containers that would allow to use base images wisely and also told, like Bazel probably? Yeah, that's what. I, I, uh, I think I already answered uh, that. Uh, I think OCE will be basically the next big step um, because it will allow to use you know, different um, tools that are already compatible uh, in this direction. So, um, but I say it's not, for, for me, at least alone, it's not an easy task to do, um, but yeah. Another question is, um, one of the problems that Linux containers have is security container authentication that was bolted on Docker Hub post factum. Are you going to introduce image signing for the pod images? Um, so the solution that I asked is uh, to share recipes and to keep private uh, image registry. That is how I would solve it that will solve the problem entirely. Uh, so um, how it's implemented right now is just a web server where you have, where you store those, those artifacts. Um, and sharing basically how to build them, but then you can build them uh, on yourself locally would be my, my way to distribute them uh, in, a, uh, in a wise way, in, in a secure way. Um, as I said before, 
creating the registry is uh, is basically a different is a, a different project. It's like okay, now we have to start to do that properly uh, in a very secure way. Uh, the signing obviously is the first thing you want to have some signature, but then you have to implement. You know, you need some public key. Um, it's, you can do something like that. Um, for instance, um, I know there are Linux, for instance, um, I, I use Arch Linux and they have, you know, a, a battery of keys that are used to sign uh, the packages. So uh, you can have individual basically able to to upload um, artifacts and then uh, you have a huge key read that can be used to verify those artifacts. That could be a solution. Um, but as I said, I'm not an expert, and I'm pretty sure I will do some some other mistake that I already did uh, in my project. So I'm not super confident on um, on doing that. Um, I see a question in uh, uh, on on IRC. Would a make file framework similar to ports, but for images make sense? Or is there another direction? Uh, <clears throat> the, the only, uh, at the end is uh, what you want is, is automation. Um, and whatever you can use for that, for me, for me it's fine. Uh, I'm using those, those scripts because uh, um, to create image. Um, I use scripts because what you do is you have to always discriminate what you're doing in the host system or what you're doing inside the system. So basically, um, the, the flavor are not just um, a script that is executed inside the J uh, at creation time. It's also, I mean, you can also provide some uh, automatic configuration of your pod. For instance, you want to add some some mount volume. You want to copy a file uh, from outside. So the, the the shell script is executed inside, and then there is another component that can be executed to um, to impose some configurations to your pod. It can be stored basically at the end in your image. So uh, make to just with make file seems to me a little bit of a limitation. Uh, we had another yeah, question from yeah. Mark Johnston on the, <clears throat> the Zoom chat. He asked, would a functional union FS help you? Uh, huh. So um, if union FS can, could be a good substitute for um, for uh, overlay FS. So basically in Linux, they have this overlay FS when you have you know, multiple layer of a system that can be meshed and then uh, only the upper layer. So basically you have kind of layer sheet here to, to do that. Um, that could be, um, I mean, the good part of using ZFS natively is performance. Uh, you don't have to think about it. Um, with overlay FS, you know for sure that you cannot write efficiently or read efficiently. So usually what people do is to mount volume externally to, to have some uh, IO performance on, on Docker. Um, but yeah, a, a way to, um, I guess there is something similar in, in, in ZFS to do overlay, um, but I, I'm not an expert. Uh, the problem with delete, um, Containers that they use basically all the technology inside an operating system, and I know some of them, but not all of them. Um, prob I'm not an expert, so maybe yes, um, but I don't know exactly how Union FS works. Yeah, just reading the chat. Um, 
using ZFS clone to get similar functionality, it's hard to update the clone used as the base previously image. Yes. Um, so one idea that I have uh, currently to, to basically create a second layer is not to, so the final image doesn't have layer, but my idea is to have, you know, I have a base image and then on that building another image. So basically you can clone and create a difference and then invert them to the snapshots, create everything, and then basically do a promote, and then you will promote them back to, to establish the, the error sheet. Um, I don't know if it's a good idea. Uh, I didn't try it yet, but we'll still keep basically all the information there. Uh, and there's another limitation with images uh, if you want to have a proper registry. Um, currently, I'm trying to keep things simple. So basically, if you want one container, there is one image to load. If you want instead to have, you know, this uh, here or she, uh, you have to keep all a, a proper database because, okay, my image needs another image, needs another image. So you have to keep the dependencies and download all those dependencies and rebuild them all at the same time. So that is a complication that invalidates the simple model that uh, I'm using. And that's why, again, images are something that are completely missing when we speak about uh, uh, JS. But I'm open for any help or good idea uh, that can, can improve the situation. I mean, the, the point is, what I did is it used relatively simple um, ideas, but they are, they show the, the, the limits somehow. Um, uh, yeah, I guess using FreeBSD PKG base would be a great step forward. Yes. Um, I didn't want to try. The problem I have to build somewhere uh, all my package base and then uh, build them. The point is, um, if you want to create an image with previously 11, this is not viable. So basically, it's not retro compatible if you want to build some image that is uh, based on an older um, previously. So once it adopted, yes, for instance, if it's available for, for 13, it's something that you can do. It's available for 12, but you have to do on your own. I see a lot of discussion about signing images. I, as I said, I'm not uh, a security expert, so I didn't adventure myself on this area because I could just do my thing. I have actually one question for, for the crowd. Um, Go for it. The, the idea that I put there to create a cloud working group, uh, what is the, the, the reaction? I mean, there is this feeling in the community that uh, we are somehow losing the train uh, going to the cloud or is something that we shouldn't bother at all and it is just, you know, a thing, but we don't care. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I don't know if there's a unified view in the com in the community. In particular, I don't know that like the majority would feel that we shouldn't care. Um, I think we would very much like to have um, it be more competitive in that space than we are. Um, but yeah, you need to find a couple of folks who want to work on it with you um, that who are also interested in it. So I think calling for a working group is good. Uh, I think you can reach out if um, like. Asking today is good. You can also send a mail on developers at, um, and, and also like to hackers at or, you know, public forums as well, and just get a group going and form a schedule. Uh, I will try to reach the dev uh, to see. Uh, the point is just to, you know, coordinate the efforts. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, the first step for instance would be um, provide a good standard for images. I mean, working on, on GCP, I found, um, so a dependency is to have ZFS. You need ZFS volume there. And working on GCP, the images that are there are UFS only. And, oh, I need to create. And then, uh, you know, it's kind of thing. And, okay, I touch a disk and then the, 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 the I touch a disk and then virtual machine didn't boot anymore. Yeah, the cloud. Uh, so, that is something that uh, it would be nice to, you know, to have some more coordinated approach because 
uh, uh, when you start to work on, on the cloud, you somehow lose the, the operating system that is working. You just see those APIs. And then what the developer do is just creating containers that they want to be executed there. And I guess we saw in, in a, with a couple of vendors that say, oh, user, I mean, developers want to use Docker and they want to deliver Docker somewhere because they, the point is when you have a container, you can move the container in all your stages. You create a container in the build pipeline, then you can test it. And then the exact same artifact can be put in execution in production. So that is the value that is created in, uh, with the container. Um, so if you cannot provide all the step in the chain, it's somehow, um, uh, it's not too complete, so it cannot be used. Um, well, I see a lot of movements uh, in the RC channel, in RC channel. Um, and I, I don't know if there is Baptiste around. I have one very wild idea. Um, was to use uh, the orchestrator to have no uh, Poudrier, basically be able to amplify the parallelism that you have with Poudrier. Uh, so at a certain point, being able to compile a lot of things and just using you know, all the, the, the worker that you have. So uh, you're not limited by, by one server, but you can scale up and have for you know, big, um, big ports, use more CPUs for other ports, use less CPU. So you can have uh, some, some optimization run there, uh, but it's somehow a little bit complicated, uh, but some, it could be doable. Um, I think we might need to wrap up and head towards our social so we don't run too far out of time. I know we've ran over a little bit on the 14 one, so. But thank you very much, Luca. That was a very interesting talk. I know I got to see an earlier version of it at, at Euro as well. So I've, I've been watching very interesting stuff. Um, so I think we're going to move on to our closing session next.